This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. This is July 27, 2010, Cynthia Jensen from University Advancement. I'm here today to interview Frances Bedford on her history of the university. She is faculty emeritus uh, from the music department at UW Parkside. Fran, could you tell me a little bit about your background, where you were born, where you grew up? Sure. Well, I was born into a family of two sisters and one brother on Murray Hill Farm in a house which my grandfather built in 1910. I was just outside of a small northwest Missouri town called Oregon. And although it was a farm home in the early 1900s, we had city water for indoor plumbing and the new dairy barn was a model for its time in the countryside. During all my childhood, a strong work ethic was instilled in us children and we were taught how to take responsibility. And we were encouraged to take the initiative when it was appropriate. Was your family a musical family or could you talk about your family's music background a little? Well, my father, whom I fairly idolized, was a first-rate amateur musician and his beautiful whistling improvisations always signaled his approach in the out of doors. He whistled everywhere he went. He played cornet in the local band during his high school years, and then he became the first ever French horn player in the orchestra at the University of Missouri, and was in the university marching band also, the Salukis. When the St. Louis Symphony once uh, played a concert on the university campus, he was invited to sit in with his horn on a rehearsal. Afterward, they offered him a job of playing French horn in the St. Louis Symphony. Had he been able to accept their offer, my life would have been changed. And as we four siblings grew up, piano lessons were a given. Being the youngest, I had the distinct advantage of listening to the others practice their piano, and I started out by playing by ear some of their easier tunes by the time I was around three or so. Piano lessons with the local piano teacher, Mrs. Simpson, began when I was four. With the cash flow at a very stagnant pace during the Great Depression, I often arrived at my piano lesson with music under one arm and a bottle of cream or a pound of butter or some kind of farm produce was in the other arm to pay for it. My dad taught each one of us four children an instrument so we could play in the school band. It was either clarinet, trumpet, or French horn. He himself continued playing in the summer community band. Uh, for quite a number of years. We all sang in the church choir and we girls took turns in accompanying the Sunday school singing on the piano. And Sundays in the winter time were given over to music in the front parlor. And the first person I ever accompanied on the piano was my dad playing Robin Adair on his cornet. I still remember that very, very um, carefully. Did you have a favorite style of music, music growing up, Fran? Or were there favorite works, songs, or artists for you? Well, when we uh, made visits, which were many, to my Murray grandparents, uh, they let us listen to the records on the old RCA Victor wind-up gramophone. And we, we really enjoyed listening to the music, but also <laughs> we loved winding up that old... Uh, gramophone and also then listening to the music as it would go lower and lower and lower in pitch as it would be winding down. But at home we had our own tall Edison machine with its playback system and I would have to stand on a chair to put on the Edison records for my dad's extensive record library. And that was a rather exciting introduction to the repertoire of Fritz Chrysler, played by Chrysler himself, and hearing the Scottish ballads sung by Henry, Harry Lauder, and the operatic arias, and the suites and overtures, and many others, all of which helped shape my taste in classical music. During high school, I heard my very first live piano concert, which was given in St. Joe, Missouri, by, a, by Jose Eterbi, and I was very impressed. And after high school, 
Uh, where did you attend college? Well, after high school, I attended the University of Missouri at Columbia, my father's alma mater. Majoring in music was never a decision as such. It was just a continuation of my love for music from my earliest days, and my five years in Columbia were some of my happiest. I worked hard, and I think I did well. Student work pay in those days was 15 cents an hour. But by changing jobs each semester, I quickly worked up to 75 cents, a grand salary, uh, playing piano for the modern dance classes at Stevens College for Girls, which was also located in Columbia. I was active in extracurricular activities uh, as president of the YWCA and later as president of the Associated Women Students, which was the all-campus governing body. I felt fortunate as a senior, senior to be elected to Mortar Board and to a group named LSV, which was an honorary for um, five or six senior women. Can you tell me a favorite story of your uh, college years um, or your graduate school years or uh, what happened after? Well, it was at this time when I was as an undergraduate that I met and Emmett Bedford, and then while I was in graduate school, we were married. He'd been dating another music student who was a violinist and a soprano. Uh, she was an extremely beautiful young woman named Elizabeth. One day, Elizabeth asked me to play her accompaniment while she sang on a student recital. So we rehearsed all right, but I'm afraid a streak of mischief overtook me, if not outright jealousy. And in the performance, I transposed the entire accompaniment up at least a full step higher. Elizabeth sang beautifully as also, but was working very hard to reach those high notes, which now are even higher. Uh, she got her usual applause, but I am not sure she ever figured out just what was going on. And I a little inside chuckled to myself thinking, Elizabeth, leave my boyfriend alone. <laughs> Which musicians influenced and inspired you as your career developed? I think you touched on that a little bit, but if you could talk some more about your college experiences. Well, one high watermark uh, college experience I had was attending a concert presented by pianist Vladimir Horowitz in Powell Auditorium in St. Louis. An extraordinary musician, he had the ability to play strong pieces, very difficult pieces, very creatively. In some of his own arrangements, he could give the illusion there were at least five people playing at the keyboard. Although I received a Bachelor of Science in music education, teaching music in a high school was really not something to which I aspired. The degree was taken as a sort of an insurance, which was a rather common practice in those days. I really did not at that time know just what I wanted to do in the music field, but I jumped at the offer which came immediately of a position to return to Mizzou as a teaching assistant in music theory. Later on, while living on the East Coast, I became a piano teacher in the Montgomery County, Maryland schools, and I knew that was what I enjoyed doing. I took pedagogy classes at American University and teaching class, piano to classes of students, and that prepared me for teaching in the Bethesda and Chevy Chase, Maryland schools. By the time we left Washington, D.C., after 15 years there, I was promoted to supervisor of class piano teachers. This experience prepared me very well for a position at the, uh, in the School of Music at the Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Five years teaching piano classes at Southern Illinois University more than qualified me for a similar position at UW Parkside. So what led you to decide to focus on the harpsichord? Well, during those 15 years living in the Washington, D.C. area, I had attended a Christmas concert in which I heard a harpsichord playing in a cantata by Johann Sebastian Bach. I liked what I heard. The clarity and precision of sound really captivated me. Most of all, I liked the extensive Baroque literature which was written for it. So when we moved to Carbondale, Illinois, I proceeded to become a harpsichord student there in the 1960s and went on to a degree in harpsichord. Then later at um, UW Parkside, I owned my own double manual harpsichord and I 
formed the Parkside Baroque players with flutist Frank Sutholz, violinist Marla Mutchler, and cellist Harry Lance in the 1970s. We played together for several years and represented UW Parkside in the community and surrounding areas. I hoped very much that our visibility would help to recruit students and broaden the outreach efforts of Parkside. And this particular combination of instruments, which is harpsichord, violin, flute, and cello, is one for which many composers, both Baroque and contemporary, choose to write. So Fran, how was the Bedford duo formed? Well, I'd have to back up a little bit um, to say that during all the while of studying and teaching, I was raising a family of three children. I taught them all piano by incorporating them into my studio of private piano students, and each also took up another instrument, one the French horn and another the violin. Uh, she was taught by her father, the violin. The middle son, Monty, chose to learn to play the oboe, took lessons on it, became proficient, and found that his mother was willing to play his accompaniments for him. Time rolled along and he graduated from college with a master's degree in oboe performance. Still, his mother was playing his accompaniments, this time on either harpsichord or piano, and we branched out with concert tours in the Midwest and Southern states, now billed as the Bedford Duo. Then when Monty was invited to play in Edinburgh, Scotland for the International Double Reed Society Convention in 1981, his mother accompanied him. We gave the European premieres of some of the dozen works which had been written especially for us. It felt good. Why not play across the pond again? So three European tours resulted in the mid-1980s with concerts in cities including London, Oslo, Prague, Bucharest, Budapest, Munich, Heidelberg, Luxembourg City, Saarbrücken, Germany, Reykjavik, Iceland, Sarajevo, Titograd, Nabisad, which is near Belgrade, and Skopje, Macedonia, Yugoslavia. Some of these concerts were part of a noontime concert series like the one at uh, St. Martin in the Fields and, and also at uh, St. James's, which was Piccadilly Festival in London. And two were at museums, uh, those in Oslo and Reykjavik. And three were an evening series, such as Munich and the Heidelberg and the Saarbrücken. Several were sponsored by American embassies or American information centers in the communist countries. With an NEA endorsement, the Arts America program for the United States Information Agency endorsed the duo for, for performances sponsored by the U.S. embassies and the USIA division of the State Department. The Yugoslav tour was focused on Americans playing American music in the Iron Curtains. Besides a classical repertoire, we played from modern American composers and our own arrangements of Gershwin, Scott Joplin, and Broadway hits. The audience was familiar with this music but had no access to copies of it. A dinner guest in Bucharest asked for a copy of my Gershwin music to food a copy but as I was playing my own arrangement from memory and had no music to land, sadly I couldn't accommodate him. A cablegram at our Prague hotel requested we immediately contact the next sponsors, those in Budapest, and it had us a bit uneasy for a moment. We laughed though when we learned they were very worried and wanted us to cancel out one of the pieces written by an American composer on our upcoming program or for equal time they'd have to engage a Russian trio to come and give a program of Russian music and they couldn't afford that. Not so much for life behind the Iron Curtain. A most sobering event though, I might tell you, took, event, uh, took place uh, right after our concert in the border town of Saarbrücken. Tensions were running high at that time in the mid-1980s between some freedom fighters and other factions resulting with our sponsors receiving notice that if those Americans, meaning we, played, the hall would be bombed. We noticed the bodyguard with us all of the time and the concert was a bit late in getting started because everyone in the audience was being searched at the entrance. 
but we've been told nothing of this undercurrent. We played one of our best. Immediately afterward, our sponsor took us aside and divulged the, su the supposed plot. What a strange feeling. The audience had risked so much just to hear us. To my knowledge, never again was the Bedford duo the cause of a bomb scare. Besides the musical rewards of playing in some very beautiful European venues and also the European audiences, which seemed very engaged in the music right while you were playing and also were extremely appreciative of it, our tours provided us with a real boatload of unusual and exciting memories. Now, I can't say that these, those concerts were recruiting tools for Parkside, but my experiences helped me in understanding a couple of music major piano students entering Parkside from Yugoslavia a few years later. During my Parkside years, I routinely spent the weekdays on campus with weekends devoted to rehearsals with the Parkside Baroque players or other chamber groups I was with at the time. Later on, such weekends were devoted to research work, culminating in the 600-page book titled Harpsichord and Clavichord of the 20th Century. Um, looking back on your performances, Fran, if we could just step back in, into some of the information you've just given us. Um, you've had so many experiences, so widely uh, and varied. Is there any particular audience or show that stands out in your memory? Oh, I just would have to say those which we played for in Europe, unfortunately. I uh, wish we could say that for good old Wisconsin, but uh, they really, perhaps it was just the austere life they were leading, uh, which was very, very austere, and we came to appreciate that fact, you know, in which they couldn't even get um, aspirin to relieve their arthritis. Mm -hmm. A simple thing as that. And um, they just were very appreciative of everything we did, anything we did. Is there any place you would have liked to have performed but didn't get the chance? No, I can't think. No, I don't think so. Uh, there's hardly been a stone unturned. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about your community involvement during uh, your 25 years of, of service with well, the music program? Yes, some of my uh, involvement in the community, well, most of it really was on the musical side, uh, not uh, so much social, but uh, involved adjudicating music, the music scholarship program sponsored by the Racine Friday Optimist Club. And I also served on the Racine Symphony Orchestra Board of Directors and the Choral Arts Society Board and the Wisconsin Federation of Music Clubs and served as liaison with the Schubert Music Club of Kenosha, and I helped with their music programs and also the, their scholarship program, which has been since feeding into Parkside. Also, there, were, um, there was the grants committee, uh, music grants committee of the Wisconsin Arts Board I served on. Also, there was Racine Arts Board Grants Committee. And during that time then, I was harpsichordist with the Racine Symphony and the Kenosha Symphony, the Waukesha Orchestra, and the National Arts Orchestra, and other area chamber orchestras, insofar as they needed my instrument to play their Baroque music. Looking back on your, your time at Parkside, um, can you talk a little bit about your early years at Parkside? Well, my early years of teaching at Parkside uh, uh, were during the time when there really was not the use of computers and other technology. It was really later on then very minimal, and, but of course has increased many fold. And the many advancements in these areas are really quite staggering. And, but they open up many opportunities of possibility. Still, the need remains strong for musicians to learn to develop and express tone, musical line, and all the other qualities which are required for good musical expression and understanding of it. Students still need ambition and drive to learn all they possibly can. Technology will never replace that need. Fran, could you touch on the framework that you 
you worked your way through over your years at Parkside and um, and maybe also talk about some things that you consider personal milestones during your time at Parkside? I came in uh, 1970, which was a time when the faculty was being greatly expanded at that time. And the administrative uh, framework of the faculty level seemed always very weak and it was a, I found it a challenge to work within. The faculty was not in departments but into disciplines, which is a very hard term to understand both by those of us who were in it and also by the, the general public. Where do you teach? Oh, I teach in the music discipline. Like what? <laughs> and we, di disciplines were part of a division. We had not faculty chair people, we had coordinators. And the change to the academic departments with chairs was a huge step forward in understanding and also in functioning. Then there was the School of Science and Society. What does that mean? And if you're applying to school, where am I going? Oh, I'm applying to the School of Science and Society. But um, clearly the university needed a standard repertoire of labels, which it finally adopted. And that was only after many years, though. I, I always found that I greatly missed having female faculty colleagues on campus. And it felt difficult to try to function within the old boy the old buddy system. But now we have a good functioning framework of a music department with a department chair and a core of good musicians on the faculty. They're, I, I look upon them as being hardworking and of very good spirit. And what was your progression uh, throughout the uh, discipline? I started as a lecturer, then advanced to an assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, and graduated, that is, retired as emeritus professor of music. Quite a lot of steps for one I felt that came already experienced in what she was asked to do here, and for which there was a very deep need at that time in filling out a complete music faculty. What do you, what do you think are the factors that, that changed uh, has changed Parkside over the years? Well, I could see the department attracting a wider range of students, students with more talent, let's say, and those who can continue their musical involvement while studying other other majors, many science majors and, and the one in the other arts, uh, like continuing what they have started well in high school, and here is an opportunity for them to engage in that. And having on-campus living facilities really greatly, greatly helps. The music department should be able in the future to attract more music festivals, area and district high school competitions, area music teachers and their students for performances and weekends on campus, and even the Parkside Music alums with their musical performing groups. In short, all kinds of possibilities with new facilities. And speaking of new facilities, Parkside next year about this time will be opening the doors on our new Bedford Concert Hall. And um, could you talk about how that will play a role in, in Parkside's future? Well, I, thought, I have always thought that Parkside could and really should become a cultural center for all the arts, not only music, but theater and art, which it's becoming. But it should be a magnet where the highest art forms could be presented, not only for the university community, but for a real quality enjoyment and benefit of the entire southeastern Wisconsin region. But all of this will require a focus of vision, uh, take a real steadfast, steadfast drive and energy toward making it happen. If the new communication arts edition is to be successful as we hope it will be. All of those human factors need to be in place. They won't happen automatically or by simply willing them to be so. For a good number of years now, the university has had the privilege of awarding the Francis E. Bedford Scholarship, plural, scholarships in music. Could you talk about um, uh, 
What led you to establish the scholarship uh, fund for our music students? I've always believed strongly in investing in people, and therein lies the value in scholarships. I look upon a scholarship as an opportunity. To offer a scholarship to a person is to offer them the chance to learn. To learn is to grow, and as the horizons grow, more new opportunities open up and a new person emerges, we hope. My own three children received generous scholarships to their uh, college of choice. We were most grateful, and I, hope that some, I had hoped then that someday I might be able to pass on that opportunity. That day came at UW Parkside when I initiated the endowed scholarship. It felt good, but why stop at scholarships? I dedicated a significant career at Parkside toward the training of students and music majors. Part of that career including, included performance. In all my 24 years at UW Parkside, there really was not a performance space for music. You have to understand the theater is not acoustically suited for musical performance, and it was already being heavily utilized for its intended purpose, theater productions, and they've been very successful. So when it seemed like there was an opportunity to achieve a real musical performance venue, let's call it a concert hall, I jumped at the opportunity to do what I could to encourage its construction. And that's what motivated me to donate generously to make it happen. Given my dedication to music, the music department and the university, it only seemed like the right thing to do. I've always espoused the uh, Latin phrase, which one of my early high school, uh, excuse me, college music fraternity had was, Vita brevis ars longa. Life is short, art is long. And with that, friend, thank you so much for taking time today uh, to meet with us and give us your views on the early years of Parkside's music program and, and for sharing a little bit about how you feel about Parkside and your, your time there and the students, certainly. Um, you've given so much to the university and uh, we will never be able to repay you for that except through beautiful music and, and that we hope to do. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia.